This month we will be taking a look at Boost, a uh, library in Boost called ASIO for asynchronous I.O. And uh, it's a fairly large library in terms of functionality and concepts and whatnot. So we're just going to get started by looking at asynchronous I.O. related to timers and serial ports. So let's get rid of that. If you take a look at the Boost documentation for all the Boost libraries. Uh, they have pretty good documentation on this library. This library has been around for quite some time. It is the basis for the networking, proposed networking support in the C++ standard. It did not make it into C++20 or C++23 which is a little disappointing, but this library has been around for a while. Uh, it's stable. It's gotten a lot of use. So it's not, um, although it hasn't been accepted into the standard, it has been in use for, as I say, a number of years, and there's a lot of experience using it. So the API itself is stable and well tested. Now, um, the one thing I would say is kind of weak about this library, which is kind of common for a lot of, you know, programmer oriented projects, the documentation could be better. It's not bad, but the thing you need to know is that instead of starting with this overview that goes through a lot of abstract concepts and uh, instead of starting there, start with the tutorial. So uh, if you're trying to incorporate this library yourself, the thing to do is to start with the tutorial and look at the examples uh, and get a familiarity of what it looks like to use this library before you drill into the overview which has these you know abstract concepts and how they're all tied together. Uh, which is why I decided to break this up into two presentations. One that gives just an overview of the library and how to use it with timers and serial ports before we get into uh, things like TCP IP networking and trying to write some kind of server or client to uh, an internet based service because it's just a lot to digest all in one go. So that brings us to um, how can you obtain this library and how do you use it? Well, what I am doing is I'm using VC package and I'm just pulling it down as a dependency of my project using a VC package manifest. The manifest is just a JSON file. I've done pre previous presentations on VC package, so if you're not familiar with the VC package package manager you can go and look at those and get an idea of how to use VC package uh, specifically in manifest mode um, now boost ASIO ends up depending on a lot of other boost libraries so if you use VC package to pull down boost ASIO it'll pull down all the transitive dependencies in boost and uh, a couple of those need to be built, but most of them are header-only libraries because most libraries in Boost are header-only. In fact, ASIO is, can be used as a header-only library. So if you use VC package, it'll pull down all the transitive dependencies yourself or itself for you. Now, that's one way to consume the ASIO library. There's another uh, variant of uh, Boost ASIO, which is just called ASIO. And it's this one at think-async.com. This is the same library. It's just been changed so that everything, all the documentation is the same and everything. It's just been changed so that the classes and the header files are not in the boost folder or the boost namespace otherwise it's the same and there is a 
what do they call it? Technical specification. That is the version of the networking uh, of a boost ASIO that is proposed for inclusion in the standard. It didn't make it into the standard, but there is the networking TS that may be supported in your compilation environment. So depending on your compiler and your standard library, the um, standard version of boost proposed standard version of boost ASIO may be available. Now, along the way of proposing the library for standard standardization, there were some changes to the library, mostly what I, from what I've been able to tell, uh, the changes are along the lines of instead of there being a member function to perform some operation, it's a free function that takes the class as an argument rather than a method call on that class. A few of the names of the classes got changed. Um, we'll take a look. Uh, all the code that I'm showing, I believe, is the, the latest recommended form and not the older form before the changes were applied through the standardization process. In the documentation, in the reference, uh, the older forms are there, but they're all marked deprecated, so it should be pretty obvious um, what you should be using. Uh, and, and they will tell you this form is deprecated, you should use the other form instead. And most of the time that involves around use the new name, use the free function instead of a member function. So, what is asynchronous I.O. in general? The idea is you're going to make a some kind of function call that's going to initiate an action. It's going to initiate some process, rather. And usually this is initiating an I.O. operation like a read or a write. And that operation is started and control returns immediately to the caller. That operation will complete at some indeterminate time in the future and you will get some kind of notification that the operation has completed and then you can obtain the result either an error code or some kind of information about the completed operation like the number of bytes transferred either number of bytes read or written. If it's a number of bytes read then you can read the bytes that were supplied through some kind of input buffer. Now um, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're doing things with multiple threads. Asynchronous I.O. does not require multiple threads although the two are often used together. Things are simpler if you just used a single thread so how, how is that possible that um, things can be happening asynchronously on a single thread? Well, and the answer is that the concurrency is happening in the operating system. So for instance, when you um, do this manually by yourself on Windows, what it looks like is you've created file handles with a so-called overlapped I.O. flag and then you initiate an I.O. operation on that file handle, either uh, supplying a buffer for information to be written into, in the case of a read operation, or supplying a buffer from which information is written, in the case of a write operation. The lifetime of that buffer is extended. The, the, the buffer obviously has to stay alive for as long as this I.O. operation is in flight. And then Windows notice, notifies you uh, through its, um, it's not really like uh, inner process communication, you can kind of think of it that way, but the, the, the operating system notifies you uh, through a handle and you um, wait on that, you can wait explicitly on that handle or you can pull that handle to find out if the operation has completed. And then once it's completed, you can then do the next thing that you want to do, either process data that was read or get ready to give it more data to write. In Linux, which is really Unix, the idea of asynchronous I.O. has been around quite some time, came around with um, 
it's probably it might predate Berkeley sockets, but Berkeley sockets are I, I think where it was most commonly popularized. And in Berkeley sockets, the idea is that your network connections are just file descriptors like uh, file descriptors in Unix are the integer numbers, not the file stars that you get from C uh, F open. But the file descriptor integers that you get from a call like open, which is a POSIX call. Open is not a C library call. That's a POSIX call. And these integer file descriptors represent the open files that you're communicating through. And when you open a socket, you get a file descriptor back. And then to perform asynchronous I.O. with Berkeley sockets, what you do is you, uh, you build what's called a file descriptor set, which is a set of file handles, uh, sorry, file, set of file descriptors, these integer numbers, and you use the select call, and um, you can find out which, if any, of the file descriptors has pending reads or writes uh, through select. And normally, you, might, you would use select in a blocking form where you, um, you call select with the file descriptor set and a timeout value, and it either returns when there's data ready for reading or writing on any of the file descriptors or when the timeout has expired. If you give it a timeout of zero, it just returns right away and tells you if any of those file descriptors are ready or if the timeout occurred, which if it's a timeout of zero, it means you timed out waiting for zero seconds, so that means there was no data available on any of the given descriptors. And that allows you to keep going and do something else while you're waiting for the I.O. to complete. Now, that's kind of a polling style mechanism, as you might imagine. It's not the most efficient. Later Unix uh, implementations, it, and it's specific to the different Unix, whether it's a System 5 or whether it's Linux or what have you, because it requires some kind of kernel support in Linux, give you the ability to say, just put me to sleep until there's something. And then wake me up when it's when when something has happened, so you're not busy waiting. That's better than polling. Um, however, if you're trying to write cross-platform code, this can be annoying because the, the, the sockets and uh, kernel polling kernel mechanisms in the various Unix flavors are all different. They have different semantics compared to uh, Windows with I/O completion ports. Um, so the nice thing about boost ASIO is that it unifies all that into a single mechanism. Now, in boost ASIO, it's a so-called, uh, inversion of control. If we take a look back at the, uh, documentation here, uh, looks like I closed it. So we will just go there again, boost org drill into documentation, current release, and then the ASI library. Okay, so if we look at, here's a uh, basic idea of, uh, let's kind of go down here to this diagram. So your program initiates uh, it, well, it contains uh, some kind of object that's doing asynchronous I.O. You make a call on that uh, object. It is attached to some kind of execution context. And um, in, when you ask to do that operation, you supply it a completion handler. That's the thing that's going to get invoked when the I.O. operation has completed. And this I.O. context is the thing that interacts with the operating system API. So instead of interacting directly with Berkeley socket file descriptors or with handles from um, objects that you create in Windows, you interact with this I.O. context and the I.O. context uh, decouples you from the operating system. Now, um, if we go look here, see if we can find this. Okay, so uh, 
they they have like um in in the documentation this is why i say it's best better to start with the tutorials and the examples rather than starting with their kind of theoretical explanation of things um because they are a lot of this discussion in their the beginning of their documentation is very abstract and so it can be confusing if you haven't worked in this space before or if you haven't if you're not familiar with these patterns but basically everything looks like this you have you initiate an asynchronous operation by calling some function and then later that asynchronous operation calls a completion handler so here's a little timeline diagram with time progressing to the right so first you uh, initiate the asynchronous operation and that puts you in this phase one where the asynchronous operation is outstanding and then something happens to complete that asynchronous operation and at that point the externally observable side effects of the operation are established so what does that mean it means I initiated an asynchronous read the operation is outstanding at the point where the operation is satisfied that means the buffer that I gave it to to read data into has had the data put into it and then the so the asynchronous operation is completed and at some unspecified time later the completion handler is invoked and the completion handler can then access the consequences of the action now they, they go through you know some more uh, you know descriptions of these uh, concepts of you know executors and allocators and cancellation and completion tokens but I think it's it's better to look at some code kind of see what's going on to make it more concrete and that's why starting with a timer is a good example so uh, let's go down here uh, look at we'll go top down by looking at main so we've got this IO context uh, and this program that I've written it's just it's got a timer that's firing and I'm reading from the console and there's a little bit of funny business because of the way uh, the console works on Windows which I'll explain but it, it, it's just to show you how multiple things can be happening uh, in a sense concurrently but they're all actually happening on a single thread but asynchronously so I establish my IO context this is my bridge to all the operating system functionality this little uh, service class is a thing that I've written uh, which we'll take a look at in a second it's going to take that IO context I'm going to start a, a thread a separate thread it's going to take a reference to my service it's going to um, get blocking uh, console input from the keyboard and when that uh, blocking uh, that, that thing is a while loop that runs forever until I type control C so when this exits I'm going to use that as a condition to stop my main service that's doing all my asynchronous stuff I'm going to uh, call run on the IO context we'll talk about that in a second I'm gonna join up with that second thread that I've created and then we're gonna exit out from this program so you might have noticed when I was describing how asynchronous operations perform there was a bit of hand waving there where I said you know at some kind of unspecified time in the future the completion handler runs and somebody has to be waiting around for these uh, IO events to take place and that's what the run method on the IO context does so your IO context as I said is the bridge to your operating system API and that might be a select style mechanism on Unix or it might be a kernel polling mechanism on Unix or it might be IO completion ports on Windows and we're decoupled from that but we have to get that code that's waiting for these events to happen and when the events happen looking up the associated completion handler and invoking the completion handlers somebody has to do that and that's what 
the run method on the IO context does. Um, in terms of my little service here, um, we've got a constructor, we've got a stop method, and we've got an input method that takes a character. That's the public API. In my constructor, I'm creating it an ASIO timer. So this uh, M underscore timer is a steady timer from Boost ASIO. Uh, by default, Boost ASIO for its timer will use uh, the, the Chrono facilities from the standard library. And if you've looked at the Chrono facilities, you'll see that there's various kinds of clocks. So the, uh, the, the steady timer is a clock that's guaranteed to always be increasing but it's not necessarily a high resolution clock and what I'm doing is uh, only firing this timer once a second so I don't need a high resolution clock a high resolution clock might be able to wait not just at a granularity of milliseconds but perhaps at a granularity of nanoseconds right I mean modern CPUs are executing very fast so if you're need to monitor something at high frequency you might need to wait only nanoseconds instead of milliseconds however I'm just gonna fire once a second so the steady timer is fine for me um, there are other timer classes in boost ASIO if you need access to the high precision clock you can instantiate one like that uh, when you create this timer it needs to be attached to the IO context and it takes um, the amount of time to wait until the timer will fire. And what I do um, is I'm going to fire this timer every millisecond, or sorry, every second, because it's just going to print out uh, the current date and time. So fi you know, at one second intervals or one second accuracy. So there's no point in firing it more than once a second. Um, so that is when you initially construct the timer you can can construct it with a um, a delay time it's basically time relative to now so I'm saying this timer is going to fire one second from the time that I um, have created it all the timers are single shot so they fire once and then they don't fire again um, and let's comment in the chat that they're having trouble hearing the audio. I'm just going to say it will be uploaded to YouTube later. Uh, downside of using free software like Jitsi is it's meh, can't control what it does to the internet. Continuing. Uh, so um, the, when we construct this timer, we're going to construct it to fire one second after the time that we create it and we're going to wait on that timer asynchronously and this uh, argument to the timer is our completion handler it's a lambda and the lambda takes uh, an error code the, the the completion handler rather takes an error code that tells us whether you know there was some kind of error or whether the timer fired I'm, I just assume that the timer always fires and Essentially, what I'm going to do is uh, it's going to fire after one second, and then I'm going to queue another um, delay on the timer to have it fire again one second later. There's a question in the chat. Just why does the timer need the I.O. context? Because all asynchronous operations have to be initiated through some kind of system API, whether that is, uh, you know, using select you know BSD socket style or whether it's using a win32 timer with an event and so on so the IO context is associated with all of your asynchronous resources there's uh, more details about why it has to be associated with a specific context you might think like oh but these uh, system report these system APIs they're just kind of global functions so why does it need an actual instance but we'll, we'll see more when we get in to how an IO context interacts with multi-threading why you want it attached to a specific IO context um, it is possible for you to queue your own work as a completion handler 
onto a context, and that's what I'm doing here. I'm just saying put some work onto the IO context, and uh, this is a lambda, takes no arguments because it's just there, there's no um, asynchronous event really that is causing this to happen later. It's just going to happen whenever the completion handlers are processed. I'm just using this to initialize my display. Uh, and then we're going to wait asynchronously on the timer. I mentioned that there was some funny business with um, the Windows console. Uh, and that is because even though you can get a, a file handle corresponding to the Windows console, if you drill into the documentation, it says that those file handles can't be used with asynchronous I.O. Now the Boost ASO documentation claims that you can use the console handle for asynchronous I.O. Um, I haven't discovered which documentation is an error. I'm going to assume it's Boost ASIO is an error in stating that you can do asynchronous I.O. on the console. The, uh, if, if you Google around, you can find Stack Overflow threads and so on talking about this, that only um, blocking I.O. or polling can be done on the console. So that's why I launch my console input guy on a separate thread. Uh, I'm calling this underscore get care function, get ch. This is a function from the C runtime in MSVC that does blocking IO of a single character. So this secondary thread is going to be in an infinite loop getting a character. If it's control C character, it will exit the infinite loop and then we will stop the uh, our little service class here we will um, exit that thread and then we will join up with that thread in the end if we, when we take a look at this stop method all I'm doing is canceling the timer and setting a little uh, flag to say that we're going to be stopping and that will basically cause context.run to exit so context, the, the, the run method on the IO context will, con, will not return until there are no more asynchronous operations and their associated completion handler, handlers outstanding. So if I cancel the timer, that will remove its completion handler from the, whatever internal queue the IO context uses to track asynchronous work. And since the timer is the only thing I have running asynchronous here, uh, context that run should return once I've canceled the asynchronous input that was pending, or the, I guess the asynchronous work that was pending. So this is just my little way of this little get console input and the secondary thread. That's just my way of trying to get asynchronous input from the console on Windows. On a POSIX system like Unix, Linux, you can um, just you do regular asynchronous I.O. on file descriptor 0 that represents standard in. Um, so it's kind of a little annoying that they're, they're, you know, I kind of have to do something funky to get asynchronous console input on Windows, but you know, such is life. Uh, now, um, what I have done here, and maybe you didn't realize this if you're not... Uh, you know, programming console I.O. in detail on Windows much. But um, in recent versions of Windows, I think Windows, I think it's been there since Windows 8. Maybe it's Windows 10. But the Windows console now supports all the standard ANSI escape sequences. And I'm just trying to have a little bit of a fancier output here. So I've just hard-coded some of the escape sequences for various operations. These are ANSI escape sequences recognized by, you know, every terminal emulator out there. Uh, to clear the display, clear to end of line, uh, select reverse video, select normal video, switch to the graphic character set, switch to the normal character set. Um, this is the, the character in the graphics character set that has a little diamond glyph instead of, you know, a normal character. And then this is the escape sequence to go to a particular row and column. So when I get input from the keyboard, I am just uh, echoing that back out 
and after I've accumulated a certain number of characters, I will wrap around to character zero. If it's a printable character, I'll just put that character straight out as is. Otherwise, if it's a control character, I'll switch to reverse video and output that character in reverse video. And if it's some other kind of character that I don't recognize, I'll output this, uh, this little diamond character. So that's all I'm doing with the keyboard input. When the asynchronous timer has fired, it will call the completion handler for the timer. Now, we set that completion handler up when we called async wait after we constructed the timer. So this is the priming of the pump. We get it, uh, we set up the initial completion handler to fire on that first one second delay on the timer that we set when we created the timer. It gets called with an error code. We're just going to call this timer expired method on the service. The, uh, it's a method on the service. That's why I'm capturing this in the lambda. And when we look at timer expired, we just see if it's uh, if we got an error or the stop flag was set that we're just going to return right away. Otherwise, we'll get a string form of the time and output that at uh, row call 1, comma 40. So that's row 1, top of the screen, column 40. Not really centered, but just kind of in, you know, uh, in, you know, starting in the middle if it's an 80 column screen as you, you know, might typically have, but most people have wider screens these days because they're just running in a window. But we're going to, you know, start at column 40 and output that uh, ASCII version of the time. Then we're going to reset the timer to expire after one second from the current time. You can give it a specific time, a, a specific point in time rather than saying one second after the current time. But uh, I think most of the time, uh, unless you're doing like an alarm type functionality, you want to have a timer that fires periodically. So you keep saying expires at every, every time it expires, you say expire after current time plus some delay. And then I'm going to do another async wait on the timer. And that gets my um, next asynchronous operation in the queue. So what does this all look like when we run it? So if we run this program, I've already compiled it. You can see up here that the time is uh, the date and time is updating every second. And if I start typing characters, they appear down there in that little input field until I've typed enough. And then it'll just erase, go back to the beginning, having erased the previous stuff. If I type control characters like control V, I get those characters in reverse video. Uh, if I press escape, it's actually control left bracket is what an escape character appears like. Um, you know, certain punctuation characters can be typed as control characters like control up arrow. If I type control C, it sets that stop flag, cancels the timer, and exits the program. So I mentioned there's some funny business about how the IO context, uh, wow, that kind of pop ups get a little annoying. Um, it's just popping up the huge Doxygen comment for the IO context class from the header file. Um, so the IO context, in our case, I'm invoking run from a single thread. I have that secondary thread. But that secondary thread is not initiating any uh, asynchronous operations. It is just calling a method on my service when it gets input. And that, um, that input method does a post to post a completion handler to the asynchronous queue, asynchronous work queue. Now, the post happened from the secondary thread. But this lambda is executed from the main thread because the IO service run is where all the completion handlers are executed. So I'm, I'm queuing a completion handler on the secondary thread, but the primary thread 
is executing all the completion handlers because it is only the primary thread that calls run on the IO context. Now, uh, the multi-threading guarantees of Boost AO, ASIO are such that it is always thread safe to make concurrent method calls or function calls on distinct objects and most of the time it is not safe to make concurrent calls on the same object. The one um, supported use case for m making method calls on the same object from multiple threads is the run method on the IO context. Um, you can have a single IO context and have multiple threads calling run and when that is the case then what happens is that I in some unspecified manner the IO context will parcel out any pending completion handlers to the threads that have called run. You can have an IO context per thread and have each thread calling run on its own IO context in which case the um, asynchronous work that each thread is completing will be the work that was queued on those particular IO contexts. So that's why each uh, asynchronous resources associated with a specific IO context. Uh, by dividing things up that way it lets you decide uh, how multi -thread, how multiple threads interact with the completion handlers associated with different IO contexts. Now um, as you might imagine it can get a little tricky with these completion handlers that uh, in my case I'm just using lambdas you will see in the in the documentation that they will often use boost bind to bind particular arguments to a function like a method call you know to bind the this pointer to a method call on an object they'll use boost bind um, or they might use um, the uh, placeholder objects underscore one underscore two and so on that are provided by boost ASIO or they might use the placeholder objects from the standard library. Again, they're underscore one, underscore two, and so on. This is why I wanted to talk about the Boost Lambda 2 library. Um, you might find it handy to use that Lambda 2 library to, to write those lambdas and as an, a short expression. In my case, I'm just using C++11 uh, lambdas you know that are in the library in the language rather than a, some kind of library I find the using the lambda from the language is more concise and clearer than making a call to std bind uh, and in fact the the general recommendation now is to use uh, language lambdas rather than using a call to um, std bind or boost bind but I just wanted to be aware of that when you look at the documentation for ASIO, you might see references, you might see places where the completion handlers are written using boost bind or using uh, std bind from the standard library. But essentially, uh, you you just it, it it's a function object, right? It could be a free function that you call, and you're keeping track of things in global variables. Yuck! Don't do that. <laughs> uh, I prefer to use uh, language lambdas with a capture. However, as you might imagine, when you get things with multiple threads running concurrently, interacting with either a single IO context or multiple IO context objects, you might need to perform some kind of uh, synchronization to ensure that um, completion handlers are happening sequentially rather than concurrently. Um, they could happen concurrently if you have multiple threads using the same IO context and multiple threads are calling run on that same IO context. In that case, it's conceivable that two completion handlers on the same IO context could be running concurrently, two or more. There is a lightweight synchronization mechanism provided by Boost ASO called a strand and a strand, uh, a completion handler can be bound to a strand and 
that strand is associated with a particular I.O. context and it guarantees that no two completion handlers associated with an I.O. context through a strand will be executed concurrently. So it's a way to serialize the uh, completion handlers even when they're called from multiple threads, even when multiple threads are calling context run. Um, personally, like it's it, this asynchronous stuff is hard enough to keep straight in your head. Um, the reason being, you notice that uh, here's where the asynchronous operation is started, and then later in some other code that's potentially farther away. I mean, here it's kind of all in one class, and it's not a big class, so it's not too hard to grapple with. But it could the the initiating the asynchronous operation and the handling of the completion of the AS asynchronous operation, they could be different classes and different files and different libraries, you know, very far apart from each other uh, code-wise. So keeping track of who started this asynchronous operation relative to where it was completed can be a difficult task, and it gets even more difficult if we've got multiple threads uh, in operation. So my recommendation is always start with the simplest configuration that you can get away with and then you know introduce complexity as needed based on uh, benchmarking I mean one of the things about C++ and especially asynchronous IO and even more so with multiple threads is people are dealing with this in order to achieve high performance or high scalable scalability in terms of services and um, definitely asynchronous IO is one of the best ways to increase concurrency now I'm saying concurrency even though I my example is essentially a single threaded example but the important thing is that these IO operations especially when we're talking over the network or even just reading a large file from disk they can be very expensive relative to the speed of the CPU. And in fact, one of the long-standing pieces of advice from Microsoft to AAA game developers is to use asynchronous I.O. to load all their game assets into the GPU. And the reason that they have been giving that advice is because we're talking many megabytes of data that's read off of disk usually put through some kind of CPU transformation because the, the uh, data on disk is usually in some compressed form. So for instance, reading texture image files or reading geometry databases off of disk, it's a large amount of uh, data that has to be read in, usually um, expanded in the CPU in some form and then written out to the graphics card to get the, the, the scene data loaded into graphics memory and if that is all done with synchronous blocking IO it can be significantly slower than if you use asynchronous IO with asynchronous IO you could get the geom you could initiate reading the geometry off of disk that's stored in one file the texture images are stored in other files usually there's multiple texture image files associated with a piece of geometry these days so you get the texture reads going asynchronously as well and then your completion handlers are firing as the data is being read off of disk after you've read a certain amount of geometry you can start creating a GPU associated data structure to load that geometry into the GPU and the same goes for all those texture image files you can get asynchronous operations pending to get the associated GPU resources for the individual textures now in my case it's this first example is really simple. It's just a timer and a hacked up way to get uh, input from the console. But uh, so nothing here is really, you know, doing some huge amount of uh, delayed processing. That I mean, the timer is firing once a second. I shouldn't have to, um, you know, some kind of do some kind of busy wait. Uh, polling just to find out that a s one second has gone by and fire the timer. Now in my case um, nothing is doing busy waiting in this case because my console input is calling this blocking IO function to get input from the console 
So once I'm blocked waiting for a character, if the timer isn't hasn't fired and I haven't typed any input, my program is essentially asleep and not using any resources. Uh, that's what you want if you've got some kind of network service that's waiting for connections. You don't want it um, busy waiting while connections are uh, and until you don't want it busy waiting until a connection arrives. You want it to basically asleep until a connection arrives. Um, now, let's look at um, the serial port example, which is it's basically the same, except I've enhanced it. Uh, I've got the same timer, the same keyboard input stuff going on, only this time I've added a serial port resource. Just like the timer, the serial port is going to be associated with an IO context. Otherwise, my constructor is the same. I've got a slightly different uh, screen initialization message, but otherwise I'm uh, waiting on the timer. Uh, when I type control C, I'm going to cancel anything pending on the timer, but I'm also going to cancel anything pending on the serial port. My input function is identical um, to open a serial port. There's an open method. You, there's also a way you can, if you know the uh, file name of the device you're going to open when you create, when you construct the serial port, I believe you can supply it at that time, but we're going to do it after we've constructed the serial port. There are set option class, uh, uh, sorry, there's a set option method that takes instances of these option classes to set options on a serial port. So if you've not done anything with serial ports before a a serial port itself is asynchronous communication so um, the device on the other end of the port does not share a common clock with uh, you think of the device and the host they don't share a clock in common on the on the electrical signaling so the serial port is usually configured with some parameters that identify how the communication is to take place. This usually consists of a number of start bits, the number of data bits, and a number of stop bits. There's some kind of maybe a, an optional parity setting to allow you to detect uh, communication errors, and there's also the baud rate. Um, people often think of the baud rate as the same as the bit rate, but it's Technically, the baud rate is the number of signal transitions per second, not the number of bits per second. Um, I'm setting the baud rate on the serial port to 9600 baud here. Um, the device that I've got attached to my serial port is sending data to the host computer at 9600 baud. I didn't explicitly set the uh, stop and start bits. Um, usually, you see this... Um, uh, annotation where they might say it, it might say the communication is 8 and 1 and that means um, 8 data bits an implied 1 start bit no parity is the N and the 1 means 1 stop bit and the reason there are start and stop bits is because those uh, initial transitions don't transmit data what they do is transmit a signal change so that the communication circuitry can then synchronize um, the bit transitions when it knows the the baud rate and it knows the start bits or how it knows like oh the, uh, there's some data coming and then it looks for a certain number of data bit transitions and then it expects one or, or however many stop bit transitions afterwards <coughs> so um, excuse me. So uh, 8 and 1 is common. It's kind of the default for everything. You just need to set the baud rate typically. So that's that's why I'm just setting the baud rate. And then I'm going to invoke this uh, read line method and that's going to do the, the async read on my serial port stream. Now I'm controlling 
the device that's attached to my serial port so I know what form the data is going to come in. in. In my particular case, what I've done is I've hooked up an Arduino Uno to the serial port um, that connects via USB cable. It establishes a serial port uh, device over USB and my little uh, Arduino sketch on the setup it's gonna control one digital output for uh, the LED and it's gonna begin serial communication at 9600 baud and what I'm actually doing in my inner loop here is uh, at a approximately 10 Hertz I'm reading an analog value off the sensor pin on my Arduino. I've just hooked that up on a breadboard to a little um, potentiometer between the power supply rail and ground and that is going into the analog input of the Arduino which has a 10-bit A to D converter so it reads in a value of 0 to 1023. It, it, it gets a digital value of 0 to 1023 that corresponds to either zero volts or the power supply voltage and I'm just going to send that sensor value out as ASCII data on the serial port I'm gonna f toggle the LED pin and then I'm gonna wait 100 milliseconds so it's essentially running at at 10 Hertz then I'm only blinking the LED so when I run the sketch on my Arduino I can see the little light is blinking and I, I know that something's actually happening the, the the real work is going on I'm reading the, the pot value and sending it out over the serial port back to the host. Um, and just to look at that again. Because I'm using a print LN on the Arduino, it's going to send ASCII characters corresponding to the integer value of the sensor from 0 to 1023, and then it's going to put a new line at the end. So in ASIO, when we know that the data we're reading is delimited by some kind of fixed string we can use async read until so this is the thing we're reading from this is where the data will be stored when uh, it is read and this is our delimiter in my case just a new line um, I'm gonna asynchronously read data until I find that delimiter and then the completion handler will be invoked my completion handler is just calling my line received method on my little service class here which I've again I'm capturing this on my um, completion handler so that I can call the methods on my class uh, my completion handler is going to check the error code and just return if there was any kind of error otherwise we're going to build an uh, I stream from the serial data we're going to extract out an unsigned integer and then if the stream uh, successfully extracted that value then we're just going to do a little computation here do some formatting and, and put out some little ASCII bar graph and then just like the timer these read calls they queue a single asynchronous operation and invoke the completion handler when it's done but we're going to keep reading data from the serial port until we stop. So after we've printed out this part of the data as this little ASCII bar graph, we're going to queue up the next asynchronous read operation to read the next line. I've got the same got the same business going on with the timer and the console input. And so the only thing that's really different is down here, I'm just doing a little sanity checking to make sure that I supplied the name of a serial device as the first argument to the program. We're going to establish our IO context, create our little service class associated with that context. We're going to open the serial port from the command line argument that we are given. This is my little hack again to do console IO uh, from a separate thread. Otherwise, everything's the same as before. If we run this guy, set as startup project, run this program, oh, I need to, ha, okay. So on Windows, 
when you attach a device on the USB port, it doesn't always get the same COM port number. So my Arduino Uno is connected on COM4. You can find that in the device manager. So if I go over here to my properties, make sure it's COM4. Okay. So that's all right. So what happened? Oh, it's running. Okay. It just put my program, put my running window behind the IDEs, and I didn't notice it. So if I'm, uh, I'm, you can't see it, but I'm moving this little potentiometer here. You can see the little value is changing that's being reported across the serial port from my Arduino. I can type more keyboard input, and I can do those things concurrently. And my timer is still firing, updating the time and date at the top. Uh, if I type control characters, it's just like before. So the difference here is I still have a single thread, the main thread. Only one thread is calling context run. I've got two sources of asynchronous input, the serial port and the timer that are queuing um, completion handlers onto the internal queue in the I.O. context. And I've got on a separate thread my little blocking console input posting completion handlers when the blocking I.O. is satisfied. So this guy, he does, he calls service input, service input is doing a post on the IO completion or sorry on the IO context so it's just saying um, just add that lambda as work to the completion queue so this is this post is being called from one thread but the lambda is being executed on the main thread it's being executed on the thread that called IO context run so I've got work being queued as a post onto the IO context. I've got the completion handler for the serial port going on to the IO context, adding its um, work on there as input data is read off the serial port and uh, until that delimiter is found and then the completion handler is invoked. I've got the timer firing and putting its completion handler on when the timer fires. And every, every time the timer fires it, it queues up another timer event. Um, the interesting thing here with the serial port is that I did this business here to extract out the value from this serial data. Now the, the serial data is a stream buff that comes from ASIO. So ASIO can use a, a give you a buffered view of IO happening on either a socket or on a serial port. Um, and what happens is that this data may be coming in Uh, in, in, in such a way that it's it, it doesn't necessarily come in in line sized chunks it, it comes in in an arbitrary amount of data that comes in off USB if you actually drill down into the USB specification you'll find out that um, devices in USB are actually polled they're not actually interrupt driven which is uh, was a surprise to me I didn't I didn't find that out it, it turns out that uh, the very professional like electronic you know video game players they actually prefer a PS2 style keyboard and mouse I, I have a hard time believing this but they say they can perceive the polling delay in USB through the USB stack that if you have a keyboard and mouse attached via a PS2 port on the back of your machine 
those ports are actually interrupt driven and not polling driven. So as soon as you type something or as soon as you move your mouse, the data goes to the port. The port controller raises an interrupt and immediately interrupts the CPU to get that input processed. There's a very small buffer in those controller chips, it's, but it's only like 8 or 16 bytes. So that interrupt is raised on the CPU immediately and the I.O. is handled by the uh, operating system in order to sat satisfy the interrupt. At a minimum, that data is copied out of that tiny little buffer on the interface chip and copied into some buffer in, in, in the operating system. Now, they say they can, they can tell the difference. Um, I don't know that anybody's ever done like a cognitive study to find out if, that if, if that's a placebo perception or if it actually is something that they can sense. But they, they say they can tell the difference. So um, all that aside, USB is actually polling rather than interrupt driven, but it's going to pull that serial port, find out that there's data on it, it's going to copy it into the operating system. Now, whatever amount of data that it copied is not guaranteed to be in multiples of, you know, um, text terminated by a new line. It's just going to be some arbitrary amount of data. So when we ask ASIO to read data for us from the serial port, which we do down here with this async read until, we're going to let ASIO handle that funny business of, well, does it actually have enough data to get to the new line yet, or does it only have a partial amount of data and the new line hasn't arrived yet? We're going to let ASIO handle that. And if there were insufficient data before the new line, that would be called a short read. But it could also be the other case that it could read enough data that it would have, you know, a, a full line's worth of data, some, you know, these ASCII characters up into the new line, and then it may have some extra data, uh, and I believe they call that a, a long read. And we don't want to discard that extra data. So the way that uh, I'm handling it here, you notice that the callback received the number of um, bytes that was read. I could have used that but I'm going to rely on the uh, IO stream mechanism where you, you create an IO stream and associate it with a stream buff. So this thing is an ASIO stream buff, this M serial data. I'm creating an input stream on that stream buffer. I'm extracting a single unsigned integer. That will advance the read pointer in the stream buffer up to where it's, uh, it, it's sucked out this unsigned integer and um, I think it will also consume um, well it won't consume but it will it will look at the white space following this unsigned integer which in our case is going to be the new line the terminating new line I don't care about the new line actually but I'm just going to extract out the unsigned integer and then I'm done that extraction operation on the I stream so this is the extraction operation, this greater, greater. That advanced the read pointer on the associated stream buff, which is the stream buff maintained by um, Boost ASIO. So if we didn't consume all the data that was available, that's fine. We've advanced the read pointer up to the new line, and there may be extra stuff in the buffer. We have to leave that for next time. And since we're reusing the same stream buff, the next time we do a call to async read until, so we read it out, process it, queue up the next async read until, um, we haven't discarded any extra data, and we avoided the short read problem because we used async read until to read until uh, a new line delimiter. We are guaranteed that at least there was some string of data followed by a new line. Um, a keen-eyed observer will notice that I have this std min in here. So I'm reading that unsigned integer value out and I'm mapping 0 to 123, which is what I get from the Arduino. I'm mapping that to 1 to 64, but I'm also calling this std min. 
And that's because at startup, um, we may see like some slightly garbled communication at the at the beginning. Remember, this Arduino is running asynchronously with respect to my computer. So when we establish the serial communication, uh, it takes it a little bit of um, like a couple of characters or so to get in sync with the, the serial port processing on the host, uh, particularly since USB is polled and not interrupt driven. So an old style hardware serial port would be interrupt driven and not polled. And what I noticed was that only when I start, sometimes this value would be really large. I mean, it's supposed to not be any bigger than 1023, but the sometimes the uh, new line character would get lost w when I establish communication with the serial port, and so it would be some very large number. So uh, that's why I've got that stood min there. There are other ways to solve that problem, like you could have the host send a command to the Arduino to tell it start transmitting data and then send it a, a, a command later to tell it to stop transmitting data when we shut down the application. I mean we're not running the program right now but my Arduino is busy sending data to the serial port that nobody's paying attention to. Um, so it's sending data all the time. It's just being discarded by the host because nobody's got the serial port open for reading. Um, you might not want that. You might want, in order to avoid this kind of startup problem, this kind of little glitchy value at the beginning of the communication, you might rather have it be, um, don't send me any data until I ask for it, and then send, it, send me data on a periodic basis, and then want, and keep doing that until I tell you to stop sending data. Um, it, it could certainly code that. I mean, it's just be a change in the Arduino sketch. I, I just happen to have it this way. But it's just something to think about if you're, using serial ports to talk to devices that are constantly streaming data that when you initiate the communication there might be some glitchy data at the front and you might wanna um, I mean what I could have done is I could have discarded all the data from the very first character up to the first new line in my case I just I just decided to make sure that you know it was kind of hacked into the valid range probably you know it would probably be a um, for a, a, some kind of sensor like this that's constantly streaming data, you know, with a delimiter. Probably best to scan the data at when you, after the initial connection up until the first delimiter and discard that data because it's, you know, it's partial. We don't we can't guarantee that it represents a whole data set if they're uh, delimited delimited by new lines or something like that. Um, other than that, you know, everything just continues to work as expected. I could have used this size to know um, how many bytes to extract from the stream buff in order to get my integer value. But since I have to do some kind of string to integer conversion anyway, I just thought I'd let iStream handle that and I'll just ignore the size value. Um, but that's what that size parameter is from the uh, completion handler. Now different operations have different arguments that they pass to the completion handler. In the case of the timer the only thing it communicates is the error code uh, which we saw with this you know the timer expired here it just takes the error code because there's no other information to transmit except that the timer fired when you're doing um, other read and write operations uh, usually there's some kind of data buffer or count that's communicated to indicate how many bytes were written or read um, it's possible for you to change the signature of these completion handlers by binding extra arguments on there there's a mechanism in ASIO for doing that I find that's not really necessary anymore with C++11 lambdas I can just write the lambda expression uh, and I can uh, I mean usually the reason you want to bind additional arguments to the completion handler signature is because you've got additional arguments you want to communicate um, from the time you queued the asynchronous work I just find it easier to use a lambda capture in order to do that
Um, now these completion handlers, they can be, they don't have to be lambdas. They can be, you know, plain function pointers like, uh, you know, a C style function. They can be std function instances. There's also, if we go back here to the documentation, so in addition to using uh, lambdas and std functions and function pointers like we've been doing, the, the general idea is called a completion token. And uh, this diagram is just kind of showing in a diagram form what we've been talking about. You have an initiated function. Uh, an asynchronous operation is started by some initiating function. The initiating function, in, in our case, the initiating function is a thing like async wait or post. Here's my post. Here's a post. Okay, so this is the initiating function. And that is associated with a specific completion signature. And when the asynchronous operation completes, it calls the completion handler. Now, it's possible to um, not just use a function, but you can use coroutines. You can use the promise framework from the standard library, so std promise. Uh, and there's, there's a, a couple of different flavors of coroutines that you can use. Um, you know, I, it, they go through it in detail here in the, in the documentation, but I found that uh, it's just kind of hard to follow some of this stuff because of the amount of syntactical splat to the face, if you will. Um, so it takes some careful study to kind of follow how this stuff is working. Um, as we go through the next couple of presentations, will be after we look at how to do uh, raw TCP networking and then how to do uh, HTTP type requests with Boost. We'll look at a follow-on library that um, gives a a, a promises style layer on top of boost ASIO networking that looks more like JavaScript promises which is a very fluent API and uh, we'll find out that like a lot of these kind of lower level details are just kind of boil away and give us a very clean looking API um, that lets us all in one place express do this sequence of asynchronous operations want the output of one feeding the input of the next so that we can chain them together to create reasonable looking code that expresses a, a, a collection of asynchronous operations. The code that we have here, it's not so bad because the number of asynchronous things happening is not too complicated and there's not too many of them. But as you might imagine, the, the more interesting stuff with asynchronous I.O. and talking to a server is not just one asynchronous call in isolation like I'm pretty much doing here. The serial port, I'm treating it as input only. I'm not doing a conversation. But you might imagine if it's a command response style device over this serial port, well, I have to send the command, and then I have to wait for the response, then I have to send the next command, and then I have to wait for the response, I have to send the next command, wait for the response. I have to take the output of each of the responses and use them to construct the next command. And so that's kind of a more conversational API. And when we get into that kind of a scenario, chaining up these lambdas and having them feed the, the response data to the next lambda, it starts getting more involved and starts getting more complicated. And you can easily get into what the JavaScript programmers call callback hell where they're trying to orchestrate the sequence of asynchronous operations to perform a conversation, not just a single query. And that can get um, very difficult to keep straight. And so we'll want to look at a higher level
API that allows us to express that more fluently, and that's where we're headed. But to get there first, we have to understand all this underlying stuff in how Boost ASIO works from basic level, how we can do networking, and then we'll look at uh, how we can do HTTP requests and make a REST API. And then having done all of that kind of the hard way, we'll look at how to do it with a promises style API that will, I think, be cleaner. But we got to cover this groundwork first in order to get there. So that's pretty much uh, an overview of Boost ASIO and showing you an example with timers and serial ports. Um, if we have any questions, we can take those. You can uh, either ask a question by audio or you can just type it in the chat. Otherwise, if there's no questions, we'll just wrap it up there. A uh, question in this chat, have you also used QT Serial I.O.? Um, you know, I think Serial I.O. in QT is probably one of the few things we didn't use when I worked at DAS 3D. Um, Dev Studio is a very large Qt application and uses almost everything in Qt, but I didn't use Serial I/O. I, I have never used uh, Serial I/O through Qt. Um, you know, Serial I/O is not something that is very different on Linux versus Windows, um, unless you're trying to do asynchronous I/O with a serial port. Um, because really it's, you know, you open up the, the serial device, whether it's, you know, dev PTY 24 or COM4, and you just do, you know, reads and writes on that file after you've opened it. Um, there's going to be operating specific, operating system specific ways of setting the baud rate and other serial port communication parameters. But aside from that, it's all pretty much the same. Unless you're doing asynchronous I.O., then you have as we mentioned, the difference between I.O. completion ports on Windows and doing some kind of select or uh, kernel polling mechanism on Linux. Uh, I don't know if Qt supports asynchronous I.O. for anything. It probably does because asynchronous I.O. has been around for a long time. So they might have some asynchronous I.O. framework in Qt, but I haven't looked at it. Any other questions? Okay, well, seems like that's it, so we will wrap it up there, and we will continue next month with looking at uh, TCPIP communication uh, using uh, sockets and Boost ASIO.